Okay. All right. Welcome to another edition of the Ramsey Dewey Podcast. This is podcast number 20-something with Michael Holbert. Michael, welcome back. You were on one of the early podcasts some time ago, and we're back again. Oh, good to see you again, Ramsey. Glad to see that you're nice and healthy. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks. So, as I mentioned, we're in Shanghai, China. We have been on quarantine for an extended period of time. This is new for a lot of folks out there in the Western world. This is old news over here in China. What's it been, like three and a half months, something like that? More or less, it's been three and a half months. You know, um, we kind of started having the buildup in early mid-January. I recall in early mid-January, we had the buildup to uh, the virus kind of uh, reaching uh, an uncontrollable level. And then uh, basically right at the Spring Festival, it all just, uh, you know, went down. So that was pretty much it. Yeah. yeah. Now we were talking a little bit before you. You mentioned that um, that you were actually on a train headed through, th- like stopping in Wuhan. Yeah. At the uh, man when when this was going down. So uh, what, what was that like? It was eerie. It's it's one of those you know those situations kind of like in your life where you can't really articulate a feeling correctly. The only thing I could say is that it was tense. Uh, basically, what happened was. We were coming back early from my wife's uh, family family home in her hometown, which is in Hunan. And yeah. Uh, yeah, basically, we were taking the train, and the only route was through uh, Wuhan. Now, of course, at this point, Wuhan is locked down. Nobody's allowed out. Only people are allowed in. Mm. And so what happened was the train stopped at the station for about five minutes. Two or three people got off, whether if they reside there or maybe their medical staff. And that was it. The train station was closed. No people, no cars on the road. It was very odd. Um, you know, as you've been living in China for a while, and so have I, we, it's very understandable. This is very eerie concerning the human congestion we usually see and, you know, just all the uh, how busy it is. So, you know, having a city like Wuhan, which I visited many times before this all happened, you know, it's a busy city. So to have this silence and, you know, just this intensity everybody on the train car was kind of like kind of like white knuckling it's like can we please leave Uh. yeah so of course um my wife and i did the responsible thing we got back to shanghai we got to our apartment as quickly as possible and we just we hunkered down for two weeks we neither of us left the apartment for two weeks yeah and this is something that's a lot of people find really hard i'm personally it it hasn't been difficult to me because i'm kind of a I don't mind being a a shut-in recluse, excluding myself from the world. Maybe I'm just weird like that, but a lot of people have been sending me letters, emails, messages, Ramsey, what do I do? Uh, Especially in regards to physical fitness, uh, grappling. Like, grapplers are really hard hit by this because they can't grapple, they can't make physical contact with another human being, and it's really, really hard to improve in jujitsu, wrestling, etc. without a training partner. So one of the most common questions I'm asked on my YouTube channel is, how do I improve as a grappler during this time? Mm. So, since you are the wrestling coach over at my gym, I'm going to ask you this question. I'm going to turn it over to you. What, what do you think? What would you say to those folks at home? Well, you, you can't grapple. It's that simple. Um, here's the thing. People who do, a lot of people, I'm not saying everybody does jujitsu, but definitely people who do it casually. They do it because they enjoy the experience. They enjoy the human interaction, and that's really understandable. But, you know, if you're training, you don't need a person 100% of the time. The reality is, if you can't, if you want to have a lot of the must, like the athleticism required for jujitsu or wrestling or grappling, you can easily deal with it by um, doing calisthenics. Like, there's no reason why that can't be an alternative for you for like even a few weeks or maybe even a month or two. Like, you know, just. You know, there's so many programs available online, they're free. I mean, you can just type in something silly like prison workout or you can type in calisthenics routine for like one hour, two hours. You you can build your way up either by repetitions or by time doing the activity. I go by repetitions. I'm now at, I can do 75, 80 push-ups in a row. And I do those in sets of about five or six. So I'm high up there now and it's been very helpful for my chest strength. And then I do about... 15 pistol squats each side and I do those again in sets of five or six, you know, I do uh, Navy SEAL burpees, which are fantastic for explosion and for mobility 
I do just regular V sets, sit ups, you know. Um, you know, I'll grab I'll grab something that's anchored down and I'll try to do a toe touch from where my shoulders are off the ground to work on my core. It's just these are all basic things you can do. Yeah, Listen. man. Let's let's talk about the prison workout for a while. I heard about that for the first time about twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of made sense because I'd, I'd, I'd seen these guys who got out of prison just jacked beyond belief. And I thought, man, what are they doing in there? What kind of what kind of weight training program do they have? And uh, for the most part, no, they just have a lot of time on their hands. Yeah, exactly. And when you have a great deal of time on your hands and you have limited or no equipment and limited or no space, well, I would say you have to get creative, except there are only so many things you can do, fortunately. Burpees are free, yeah. squats are free, push-ups are free, jumping up and down is free. Yeah, pull-ups are free. Yeah. yeah, as long as you have a bar to hold on to. Exactly, yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky. I mean, I say prison, I should probably say prison yard. I mean, I had the, I had the use of my complex, my apartment complex. Um, so I did a few things. You know, I was running within my community. You know, there's a playground, boom. Wait, there's that. That's your gym right there, a uh, kids' playground. Uh, if you have also Chinese communities, it's very lucky. Most Chinese communities do have exercise bars in the community. Yeah. Like that seems to be a thing here, which is actually very beneficial. So I have access to bars. Yeah, that's um, that's something I I was kind of blown away by when I first got here to China. It's like every apartment complex, every public park, has like this. I don't know how to describe it. It's it's this uh, like plastic covered, environment proof, brightly colored yellow blue yeah. equipment. A lot of it's garbage. It's it's just like these these badly constructed ellipticals. But they almost always have a place to do pull ups. Yeah. In fact, I was thinking I I found one on Taobao, like uh, one of those uh, monkey bar things. I was thinking, man, I want to get one of those. Put it on my balcony. My wife said no, and I said, but. But it can double as like a, a clothes, uh, what do we call that, to hang up the clothes to dry. Yeah. And she's like, no, the kids might climb out and jump off. I was like, oh, but I want one. I can hang up a heavy bag there, double end bag, you know. Yeah. And they're not that expensive either, which is amazing. Oh, yeah. Everything, most of the equipment sold here is pretty cheap. But um, yeah. as for people who, depending on where you are, I mean, some people probably email in saying, well, I can't do that. Our government's having a very strong stay-at-home um, policy or, you know, maybe due to environmental reasons, I just can't go outside. Maybe it's still too cold. Then you're just going to have to be creative within your household. And so that's where the prison cell workouts come in. And it's just really high repetition, high volume. That's the only thing you can really do. Now, Pros and cons to this. You build up muscle endurance. That's a pro. Um, you usually do maintain strength. It may even go up a little. But the reality is you're not going to get really that much stronger from mm. just doing pure calisthen calisthenics. You're not. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, I saw some benefits. Like I did my first lift session for the first time in three months yesterday. Uh, my deadlift got a lot weaker. I only did one. One rep at uh, 180 kg. And then, yeah. but what I noticed is I could do a bench press at 140 kg. I did one rep. That Interesting. Was a, that was a big PR for me. Like, well, a year ago, I was at 130 and I didn't really push or challenge. But that day, I decided I wanted to test my strength, took my time, did long rest periods in between. I was able to belt out one without a spot. So I was pretty happy about that. Oh, that is really interesting. I, I did squats and deadlifts last week for the first time in the, you know over three months. And I was expecting to just fall apart and crumble, but I, I have been really consistent about about uh, home training as mm. far as you know just body weight stuff. Mm. And I was thinking, man, this is going to suck. And I wasn't that far off from where I was before. Yeah, I found that I, you know, I was weaker in my deadlift, but not by too much. So, yeah, I'll build it up again. I'm not too worried. Yeah. I also did some, some sparring with, uh, with some friends of mine um, the other day. The, the gyms are slowly starting to, to reopen here, at least on, on a limited basis. Like, no kids' classes. Yeah. You have to sign in. Everybody has to know where everybody is at all times and mm -hmm. all that. But, uh, yeah, we, we did some sparring, and I was, I was surprised at a couple of things. I, I performed better than I thought I would considering the circumstances but at the same time i was i was like oh man i i realize now that particular skill set is very dependent on being able to do it over and over again consistently mm -hmm. because i'm thinking about these things after the fact 
Yeah. And so much of, of winning a fight, so much of success in martial arts, it's not being faster than the other guy, it's being faster at solving the problem. Yeah. And that's what, you know, repetition, gross repetition over long periods of time does for you. Yeah. Sharpens those problem solving skills. Yeah. And that's the thing too. So um, the, you will lose that in these situations. What can I recommend? Well, besides doing calisthenics, shadow tr training is perfectly fine. Uh, uh, you know, you don't need a person to just shadow, shadow grapple. I mean, it's the same as shadow boxing. There's no reason why you can't. Yeah, you know, this is a really new concept for a lot of people. Everybody's heard of shadow boxing, but not everybody has heard of shadow wrestling. Yeah, shadow wrestling is extremely common. Um, you know, you have almost every single top American wrestler, Russian wrestler, they spend a good possible hour to two hours a day shadow wrestling. It's very much standard. Yeah. It, yeah. A lot of traditional martial artists spend a great deal of time shadow wrestling and they don't even know it. Because a lot of those traditional martial arts forms like Tai Chi, uh, a lot of karate movements in the kata, you, even in Taekwondo, some of that stuff is shadow wrestling. But they do it all percussively and sharply, and nobody remembers that because exactly. they don't do it in their sport anymore. And so the meaning is forgot, but those movements are very much shadow wrestling to yeah. a high degree. Like, you know, you can just look up anything, like, you know, type in Jordan Burroughs training montage, like in YouTube, and you'll see him yeah. shadow wrestling. It's not like... It's, yeah, man, I love Jordan yeah. Burroughs. Yeah, man, yeah. I feel like I feel like my wrestling improves just watching that guy wrestle. It's uh, it probably does actually. I'd, I'd recommend like anybody, uh, watch really good athletes that you want to emulate, who have qualities that you want to have. Watch them, and start asking questions like like how do they do that and so on. You know, a lot of it is is athleticism developed over time. Like if you want to shoot a double like Jordan Burroughs, you you gotta man, you gotta put in the work. Exactly. It's a lot of work. He's very explosive, but at the same time, you, you'll pick up all kinds of things you never would have noticed before doing film studies on guys like that. Exactly. So, I mean, just to say that you need a partner, yes, it is essential in fighting you need a partner, but in this time period, you're not going to lose that much as long as you're being proactive in how you're training. And then some of the things you do need to do, you, you will need to basically refigure your goals for maybe two to three months and you know i don't see why th that's not possible i don't yeah. see what's the big issue about that so yeah um, for example you know if you don't have the ability to lift heavy weights why don't you take a break and do cardio for a change and see how far you can get distance wise yeah. know, what's the issue to that oh but i'll get small like so what so everybody's getting small that's Unless you have a home three gym. Three months small yeah. versus, uh, you know, yeah. a lifetime of getting small, man. Exactly. Unless you have a home gym, which is the minority of people. That's just how it is. You got to get over that. Yeah, this is a perfect time to branch out and try something new, try something different. People fear change, obviously. It, it makes sense. It's how we're wired. And we become very, very dependent on our routine. Like the first, the first month and a half of this quarantine, it was very sobering how incredibly dependent I was on my gym routine. Like I wake up in the morning, I have this appointment, I teach that class, I go do this thing. It's on the schedule, I have to do it. And then that's gone and suddenly I'm like rolling out of bed at 11 in the morning like, well, what am I doing here? This is, this is counterproductive. And... You, you just have to pull yourself up by the bootstraps, kick yourself in the butt, and get yourself on a different schedule. It's not going to be the same. It can't be the same. You're not going to improve in the same way. You can still improve, but you got to go in some different directions. That's right. Like, there's no reason why not. Like, people are like, oh, I can't do the things I like. It's like, do new things. It's like, but I like my things. It's like, oh, that's nice. Do new yeah. things. <laughs> I like, like to think of this as like an accessory work period. Like you can't get in the gym and do the heavy squats and the deadlifts, the compound lifts, the bench press. So what do you do? Do the accessory stuff. I've been watching a lot of, uh, a lot of fitness gurus online tr trying to make yeah. this transition, showing all these at-home workouts and stuff, and some of them were actually quite surprised. Um, blanking on the name, this, this lady makes a lot of great uh, fitness workout videos. Uh, at the gym, like uh, she's a power lifter. Um, Steffi, Cohen. Steffi Cohen, yes, yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I watch her. She's, she's, she's fantastic. Good. Oh, beast, yeah. But she put up this Instagram post recently about um, what was it? Just like how the at home workouts made her very cognizant of weaknesses she didn't have before. Mm. You know, a lot of people don't pay attention to the myofascial tissue, the the muscles in between the muscles. Yeah. That can make us 
much, much stronger in ways we didn't realize without necessarily being bigger or more ripped, if you will, more visibly strong, but definitely noticeably strong. Yeah, I think I could attest to that because when I switched over to my routines, I did, instead of doing one chest exercise, I did four or five different chest exercises, which I usually didn't do on my chest days. Traditionally, I would only do maybe two to three variations, but now because I need to fill in my routine and I also am not as tired, I do even more. Maybe that's the reason why I got a stronger bench in the end. So yeah, I think, yeah. Cohen, I think Cohen may have a point there, yeah. Bench press is a weird exercise. It's not one that I, I do a lot. I'll, I'll do it once in a while. Like right now, I haven't done it. Yet. I actually did bench uh, the other day after <laughs> I did my, my deadlifts. But um, it's not one I pay a lot of attention to. But I have noticed that other exercises, what, like when I really paid attention to uh, deadlift for the first time and improved my deadlift, didn't touch bench press for like six months. And then afterwards, I thought, I wonder how much I can bench. I got down and my bench press improved by about 20 kilos. I was like, what happened? I haven't nice. touched the bench, pre bench press in all this time. Deadlift made me stronger. How about that? Well, That's yeah. why they called it the king of the lifts, probably. That's exactly like the, the three power motions, you know, squat, deadlift, and bench. They all activate similar muscles. So if you're, if you, as long as you build one, it's going to make you stronger than the other. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's talk about neck strengthening. This is a question I get a lot from the, the YouTube viewers about how to strengthen their neck. And uh, yeah, and some of these guys have some pretty screwy ideas about how to go about it or why to go about it. There, there's this idea, I don't know who started it, this bro science idea that if you have a really strong neck, nobody will be able to knock you out. Excuse me? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and it probably won't hurt... But, I mean, it, it's not going to make you a worse fighter having a big, strong neck, but no, it's not going to make you, not going to improve the condition of your brain inside of your head as far as making you impervious to knockouts. But having a strong neck is good. It definitely makes you a better grappler. It allows you to maintain better fight posture, makes you harder to control. If somebody mm -hmm. can snap down your head and so on, then it's easy to control you. And I've got some ideas about neck strengthening and all that, but... Um, Michael, what would you recommend as, a, as an experienced wrestler? How do you go about strengthening your neck for grappling? There's a couple of ways to do it. Um, the easiest way, and I would recommend this especially for people who are just starting. You just lie on your back. You do yes, no, maybes. Again, it's kind of calisthenic base. You go yes, 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 yes. Bring the head, head up, up and down. down. Up and down. You're lying on your back. You do those until your neck hurts, and you go a little bit further because it will hurt at some point. Then after it starts hurting that way, you start doing no's. No, 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 yeah. no, no. Now by hurt, you mean like just uh, that soreness, yeah, muscle soreness? Or, exactly. Or, yeah, because it's very important to pay attention to the difference between like muscle soreness, muscle fatigue type of pain, and ouch, I've pinched a, uh, a vertebrae exactly. type of pain. Yeah, you'll, d you'll be able to tell the difference. And then the last one is maybe, so you go side to side. Yeah. Know. So or, or Indian yeses, how they Indian say yeses. yes in India. I've got exactly. a bunch of neighbors from India in this apartment complex, and yeah, yeah, it's kind of kind of shocked me the first time I had a conversation with them. I was like, <laughs> oh, people in different parts of the world have different body language. Yeah. That's amazing. So yeah, uh, that's why I recommend you can start with that. Do it until your muscles hurt. Go a little bit past that pain threshold, because yeah. that's you know that's how you build muscles. Okay, go past it, and then switch the exercise. Do a couple sets of that. My universal go-to is five sets. Do five uh, sets of everything. Hmm. That's a good standard. Will they give you the best results? No, it won't give you the worst. It's just a good standard. Do five yeah. sets. Reps are based upon what you're aiming for. If you're getting strong, low reps. You're trying to build muscle endurance or maybe just look jacked, high reps. But yeah, yeah that's really it. One thing I would say about deadlifts, or no, sorry, neck strengthening is do deadlifts. And this shocks people because there's no direct pressure on the neck. You're holding the bar with your hands, and people think of it as a, a back and leg strengthening exercise. But what they fail to realize is that your neck is, your neck is directly connected to your back, which yeah. is and should be engaged when you're pulling something heavy. So heavy deadlifts, in my experience, did more to strengthen my neck than any amount of bridging, which, which I love and I do all the time. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend to everybody, especially people with... Uh, with neck injuries exactly yeah that's why you know i i do teach bridging bridging is very important in wrestling but you know 
if people are weak at their bridge and they ask me what can i do you know i do ask like do you have a neck injury if no then i will tell them well if you can continue to train the bridge that's good yeah you know if not do yes no maybes if not do back strengthening exercises i do recommend back strengthening exercises so and also my go-to always for like questions i'm not sure about it's like how can i get stronger it's like do deadlifts it's fine <laughs> yeah man or do squats both work <laughs> indeed the deadlift and the squat they are the best postural exercises that you can get from strength training they will teach you to stack your bones on top of each other if you do it correctly mm. in the best possible way to support weight and stress and violent action in a fight grappling match or otherwise so man i can't stress that enough but it's 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 hard to convince people yeah in my experience hard to convince people how important squats and deadlifts are for it's for martial arts what i found is for a lot of people in martial arts especially who are doing it for just the martial arts perspective not from the uh not from martial arts where there's more of a sport element to them uh yeah. most of these people don't really want to engage in weightlifting that's just the honest truth um and the, the fact is if you're doing a fighting sport it's imperative that you do you know training you have to develop some muscular strength you need to develop yeah. not just f to be strong but to protect your body so it's really counterintuitive not to uh be lifting weights while you're training and that's yeah. the thing man it's yeah. it's always shocking to me on like every sport in the world like even even sports you wouldn't even think a deadlift would come into play. Like, you ever watch the Winter Olympics? Like the skeleton race. They get oh, on yeah. that little sled, they, they lie on their back. They go first, yeah. Yeah, oh, and they, yeah. they go down, and you would think, like, well, how strong do you have to be to do that? Now, obviously, there's core strength and all that involved, mm -hmm. but I was watching some of these Olympians who train for the skeleton race, and their training routine is intense. It is squats, it is deadlifts, heavy heavy yeah. deadlifts it is sprints it is it is all this intense plyometric stuff that in my opinion all martial artists should be doing especially competitive combat sports athletes but relatively few of them actually are yeah and that's the thing and you know it comes back to what we were talking about on our last podcast why wrestlers do so well in mma and it's really the fact that we've just uh, wrestling itself has been a sport for so long, yeah. specifically a sport that is climatized to the training regimen that's required for athletes. So yeah, the fact that wrestlers yeah. are already athletes, we're already athletes, they're already lifting the way that MMA fighters need to lift, already doing every other exercise, already doing recovery that's required for an MMA athlete. It's not because wrestling is a better style. That needs to be thrown out because yeah. that's not true. I mean, I wish it was true. I'm a wrestler. <laughs> I would love that that be true, but it's not true. That's absolutely false. The only, the reason is, is because we, the athleticism is already in place. And here's a good example, Yo Romero. Okay. Champion wrestler, fantastic Cuban wrestler. I've gotten a chance to wrestle some Cubans for a brilliant, just mutants great wrestlers but that's the thing it's their training regimen it's the way that they've been brought up from childhood up into adulthood with their training and it goes to and why bring up your Romero says he doesn't really wrestle in his fights yeah. he uses it for defensive for defensive purposes if you look at his stats his takedown defense is great fantastic mm -hmm. very flawless but all he did is he became a headhunter. He became a striker. And you'll find that a lot of the wrestlers now in the yeah. UFC, they don't really wrestle that much. They don't. They simply develop the other skills they need. And they they have the ability to do so because they don't need to worry about having a strong base. They know the training they need to continue for that. Yeah, a they, lot of these younger UFC fans are really shocked to learn that a lot of these Division One wrestlers in the UFC actually were wrestlers. Like... Yeah. I was having some conversations with guys about John Jones recently because of yeah. you know the whole controversy going down with John Jones. Yeah, there's another one, sadly. But they were shocked to learn he was a wrestler. Oh, yeah. He, he was, was a good wrestler. Yeah. But all he does is poke people in the eye and kick people in the knee. What's going on there? Yeah, so that's the thing. And also, I think the guy that probably wrestles the most that I see is Sejudo. That he probably does the most, but even then, he strikes. He, yeah. he understands the importance of striking. That's the thing. Like, you know... Wrestling simply gives has proven so far to give the best athletic base, and it's kind of based on statistics. UFC, it's based in the United States. Its largest fan pushes in the United States. Yeah, the one martial art that develops all these athletic tools required for MMA, 
that's you know relatively established for long periods of time and where you start kids at a young age is folk style wrestling in the United mm. States. Not really freestyle, but it doesn't matter. Wrestling's wrestling when it comes to these ideas. Yeah. Yeah. For, for those who don't know, what is the difference between folk style and freestyle? Well, uh, freestyle is the international style. Um, honestly, there's less differences now. A lot okay. less differences now. Uh, yeah, we were talking yeah. about some rule changes Yeah, earlier. the rule changes happened about six, seven years ago. And the new rules with uh, UWW, United World Wrestling, which uh, replaced FILA, the, International, the Federation International La Lute Association, uh, they replaced FILA f- f- years ago. And they developed some rule changes in order to get wrestling back into the Olympics. Hmm. And there, honestly, there's very f- small differences now. Uh, it used to be more large differences, like... Uh, uh, folk style escapes are much more prevalent. Uh, there's, there used to be parterre, which means one wrestler goes to the ground, the other runs on top. For years, that was not in freestyle wrestling. Okay. And then they added it. Now, recently, they added it back in. Okay. So parterre has been re put back in again, too. You get escape points. I think probably the biggest difference now, the biggest difference I can probably see right now is underbody grips in the parterre. You don't do that in folk style as far as i know is that a, a foul is that illegal it's illegal in in uh folk style uh and in freestyle it's perfectly fine because we go for exposure points and we do things like gut wrenches where we just ram our body into the ribs yeah ram our arms really deep into the ribs get it tight and roll um for example um the best wrestler i think on the planet uh Sudalayev, I, I'm probably butchering his name. The Russian 96 yeah. kilo guy, Sudalayev. He's fantastic. He's called the tank. You watch some of his exposure highlights. He just rolls and rolls and rolls. Fantastic gut wrench, and you won't see that in folk style, as far as I know. Yeah. Um, you know, I've gone to folk style tournaments. You know, I want to do that, and then the ref be like, "No, it's like, why not?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, folk style also does emphasize on control a lot. Your moves, you sometimes won't get points if it's really like what looks like a very um, uncontrolled move. Like it, sometimes the refs just won't give it to you. Right, things like that. Also, and then just some regulation rules like folk styles wrestlers as far as i know they have to always wear headgear which annoys me i hate hmm. wearing headgear never liked but that's gear. mandatory oh i didn't it's, know that i it may be it was when i wrestled down there once in a while it was okay. uh as far as i know it still is but you know don't quote me on that but as far as i can tell the ncaa seems to still enforce headgears on wrestlers so yeah so I, I got a hypothetical question about the rules of wrestling okay think about the rules of mma right now if there is a foul for example, if there's an accidental groin kick, what happens? In wrestling? In, sure, in wrestling. What happens oh. if somebody gets kicked in the groin? What's, what's the rule there? Oh, well, as far as I know, the UFC, there's no real uh, retaliation in points, but you just go to your corners and wait. But in wrestling, there would be a caution and a point given to the opposition. And if you get two or three cautions, then you lose the match. Like, it's that simple. Okay. It's that black and white in, in uh, freestyle That's wrestling. for, like, any foul. Any what, foul, yeah. What, what would happen in wrestling if one guy just blatantly punched the other guy right in the mouth? There could be a disqualification immediately. I'm not quite okay. sure. Um, you know, I was just reading the UWW uh, book this morning. I was reading over the rules. Uh, I would assume that if there was an open strike like that, like a proper strike, it would probably be a DQ, I would think, almost immediately. Uh, if not, yeah. then it would most definitely be a caution, absolutely a caution. Yeah, most, most grappling sports are, are like that, right? If there's a, a flagrant foul, generally it's immediate disqualification. The IBJJF is like yeah. that to an extreme. If you just like cross your ankle slightly over the hip to the point where it's considered knee reaping, boom, you're, you're done, DQ'd. Yeah. And the, the reason I asked this, I had a discussion online generated over a recent video where I was talking about the Karate Kid Part 3. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that one. I think I've seen this one, yeah. Where... It was titled, There's the Rules and Then There's the Rules. Because in, in the sport of MMA, uh, a lot of people say, well, that's illegal. And yeah, it is, but a better term is it's a foul. And there are certain consequences for a foul. So, for example, if a foul is deemed to be, deemed to be a flagrant, deliberate foul, purposefully with the intention of injuring the other person, then the referee does have the option to call it a, a DQ, mm. right? To stop the match immediately. But more often than not, the fouls are incidental. They, they are not deliberate. 
So when a groin kick happens, the referee will give a verbal warning, keep those kicks up, or, or you know, no low blows, something like that. Yeah. If it happens again, the referee may issue, may, and this, this is a might, might issue a deduction of a point. Hmm. Okay. If it happens a third time and only if it is deemed to be a deliberate foul, right, an accidental that doesn't apply, then, then... DQs may happen. Okay. So if we have a sport like uh, jiu-jitsu or wrestling, hmm. and we have a similar mindset to MMA, where you can punch the guy in the mouth, drop an elbow on him, kick him in the groin, and then get away with a verbal warning, like, no, 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 don't do that again. And the second time, a deduction of a point for something, let, let's say like an elbow to the mouth, right? Hmm. How would that change the sport of wrestling? Oh, wrestling would become extremely violent. <laughs> um, wrestling, As I suspected. Wrestling itself is already a pretty violent sport. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. If you don't know what you're looking at, wrestling just simply looks like grappling. But if you actually come to wrestling class, what you'll notice is most people who go to wrestling once, about 70% of them don't come back a second time. They just they don't come back. Why? Because it's high pressure combat sport. You're just, yeah, we're yeah. not punching you, but... We are striking every time of snaps. Snaps are not, snaps are not pull down. Snaps are strikes. You're coming from about a motion of, I don't know, maybe, f how much is this? What three centimeters? Four yeah. centimeters. So four centimeter length, chopped down. These guys have trained their hands to be like stone. Yeah, th this is something that kind of shocked me when I first wrestled with uh, with Michael here. He actually taught me through example what a lot of these movements I learned in karate and taekwondo actually mean without, to my knowledge, ever studying karate and taekwondo. For example, the low block in taekwondo and shotokan and all these other karate styles, the low block. We call it a low block in these traditional martial arts. And Michael starts doing this to strip my grip. Boom! Just this quick, snappy, almost like a hammer fist against against the grip. Exactly. Yeah. And I've been using it ever since. I, it just... It was like a light bulb moment. Like, whoa, that's what karate means. And I learned that from a wrestling coach. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. It's all these, like, very minute motions and that's the thing and that's really where wrestling is and it's not just even that like we'll do a snap from about three to four centimeters and if you're trained over a period of time that's going to be a strong hit it's going to be because you're not just using your arm you're not just using your hand you're using your whole body i'm pulling using my back muscle my leg muscle and i'm printing my leg back at the same time all in one motion in unison and yeah. when i do that that becomes a heavy hit on the back of your neck oh yeah and that's the thing and wrestlers are doing that all the time. I just watched a fantastic match from 2017 in the Worlds in Paris between um, Suda Sudalayev and um, the American. What's his name? Kyle. Uh, what's Was it he? Kyle Dake? No, no, no. He's the 96 kilo. Uh, Kyle, fantastic wrestler. I'm so sorry, American viewers. I'm Kyle. Um, uh, Kyle Dake's the extent of my knowledge of wrestlers not, named Kyle out not there right now. Unfortunately, Kyle. Um, it'll come to me. Kyle Sanderson. Anyway. No, not Kyle Spelled That's, that's Kale Sanderson. Kale Sanderson. He, Sanderson. He's been retired forever. He's the head coach of Purdue, I think. Yeah. Um, no, uh, he's the current. He's current 96 uh, kilo wrestler for USA. Um, uh, it'll come to me. Sorry, guys. Anyway, type it in the comments down below if you know viewers. Yeah, please. Thanks, guys. I just watched the match, and the amount of and you can find it on YouTube easily. So uh, the amount of snapping and head pushing from both these wrestlers was incredible. Such a good match. And it's I highly recommend this match. Uh, after we're done here, you should look at it. It's very yeah. good. And basically, yeah, it's that. Plus you got some head butts. You know, not exactly on purpose, but they occur because wrestlers stay at level of each other. And the best defense is to stay at head level. So if you don't want a guy shooting on you, you keep your head to his head. So no matter what, even if it's accident or not, you're going to get headbutt. It's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not usually on purpose. It's just how it is. That's how I've, you I've taken a few accidental headbutts. Yeah. Well, grappling and wrestling and usually over the eye mm. and uh, not, not pleasant, but it does happen. It does happen. Somebody asked me, how do you get accidentally headbutted? Oh, you, you, you wrestle a little bit. That's yeah. that's what you do. Because I think the number one line in defense from a shot is your head. You keep your head to the head level. Yeah. yeah. And a fun game I like to play with students who aren't used to it, the ones who do jujitsu, is like, I'll put my hands behind my back and I'll say, okay, take a shot on me. And I'll use my head to defend myself. Because I also know they're, the way they're shooting, they're not using full force. So I can just easily go, no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah. Oh, man. It's a... Uh 
it is night and day seeing, um, how can I put this, wrestling taught from a jiu-jitsu instructor who has never wrestled versus wrestling taught from an actual wrestler. And it, it's interesting because like the, the wrestling from the jiu-jitsu instructor is generally, here's where to put your hands and feet. And the wrestling from the wrestling coaches, here's how you put the violence in your violence. Yeah. One of my favorite things. Um, did, did you watch much of Mark Schultz when he was... I've watched Schultz, yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Fantastic, yeah. And Mark Schultz was a prime example of putting violence in your violence in a snap down. He, he used to call it clubbing. Yeah, I, I bought one of his yeah. old tutorials back in the day when, when he released that DVD. Man, it was interesting. And... From an outside perspective, especially coming from a traditional martial arts background where the idea is put your hands and feet in the right place and, and that's the technique. What he taught was so opposite of that. It is put the violence in the violence. Like you don't just grab and pull, you club his head down essentially. I'm like, yeah. but isn't that illegal? And he's like, no, it's, <laughs> it's putting <laughs> violence in your violence is yeah. what it is. A, but it's it's one of those things you, you have to feel to appreciate. Yeah, I that, think that's the thing. It's it's just high intensity pressure, and so you have these trained arms, these trained hands, these trained legs. Because remember, the snap down is a full body motion. Yeah. Now, what I usually do is this: when I'm training students at this point, because they're all adults, uh, if they're very low level, I always just defend myself to a point until they get a good position, and then I usually let them take. The, uh, the position and I let them finish the move. I want them to get the good muscle memory. Yeah. So I'll be like, okay, good, good, good. I'll go down easily like a rag doll. And then once they start getting good, once they actually start like more easily getting into positions, then I start adding one or two clubs. So I'll just bring in my, I'll bring my forearm into their collarbone and then I'll snap down a little bit. And then they kind of realize, oh, I have to pay attention. I guess you do. Cause now I'm actually putting a little bit of effort into it. Yeah. And then once in a while, I get a weird student who wants me to go hard on them for some oh. reason, and I'm just like, I <laughs> only learn if I go if somebody goes hard. I'm just like, okay. I've, I've had a few of those, man. I had this one student won't won't mention his name. Super nice guy, but he had some crazy ideas about the way training was supposed to work, and mm. he was a really wimpy guy. That sounds mean, but he, he was just a really wimpy guy, and he would always ask me to go like full contact. He wanted to spar full contact, full Muay Thai rules with everything. And I was like, you, you don't want to do that. No, thank you. No. He was like, yes, I do. I was like, and he persisted and he, and he persisted. I was like, okay, you, you go full contact. I'll go light and friendly with elbow pads on. Hmm. And he was like, no, no, I want you to give me everything. I was like, trust me, you, you don't want everything. So I get in, in the ring with him. I'm just kind of dancing around, just like tapping him with the elbows here, tapping him with yeah. some uppercuts, sweeping him, throwing him around and all this stuff. And and I, I thought that would get the message through. He's, he's unable to land a strike on me, just getting kicked upside the head repeatedly. Yeah. Light. And then afterward, he comes up to me and he says, you know, you, you don't hit that hard. <laughs> it was like, oh man, my message just flew right over his head in one ear and out the other. So... He wanted it to go again. And I was like, all right, you want to feel... <laughs> and I, I wasn't mean. I wasn't trying to knock him out. But I, I, I feel bad about this, actually. I feel really bad because we clinched up. I don't feel bad. <laughs> he had long fingernails, which he refused to trim. He clawed the back of my neck. Ooh. Ooh. And I was like, all right, screw this. I picked him up and slammed him with like a high dive. I actually did knock him out. And I was like... Did I just kill my own student? Oh, this is bad. This is bad. What, what? And he woke up a second later. I was like, okay, okay, good. Not going to do that again. Not going to go down that, that hole again. I decided from that point forward, you know, if, if somebody, if somebody's like that, you know, if they just don't get the message, then move on. Just move on. It's not, not worth I the know. trouble. And that's the thing. And uh, I don't really get people that want to go a hundred percent in certain situations. It doesn't quite make sense to me. I mean, Unless you are competing for some sort of title, or unless you are a professional athletes, I just don't really see yeah. the reasons for it. And even then, you should be really sparing with hard sparring. Like exactly. Hard sparring, you... Man, who was it? Tony Ferguson said in a press conference the other day, he yeah, doesn't do it anymore. Like, he hasn't done it in years. And a bunch of other great fighters, like... Um, oh, man, speaking of blanking on names, I just did a video about this dude. Um, Robbie Lawler. Okay. Ruthless Robbie Lawler, man, known for just being an animal in the cage every time he gets in there. 
hasn't done any full contact sparring in many years, like yeah. almost a decade. You always hear in uh, it, a lot of like pre-fight injuries happen because they do full full contact sparring. Yeah, you know, that's the thing. I mean, anybody can get injured at any time, and so that's really it, right? So. Yeah, these, these fighters, they put together the training camps, and their idea is that during the training camp, they will go more intense to to get the idea into the fighter's mind that they are going to go this hard in an actual fight. And my, my personal philosophy on that is when you get, like, a couple of weeks within fight time, that's probably the worst possible time to do full contact sparring. Yeah. I understand the psychology behind it. Psychologically, that can be very good if you're not getting injured, if you're winning, if you're not getting uh, bruised up psychologically, because hard sparring can give you PTSD, man. It can. Mm -hmm. If you're getting beaten up, it can get you start starting to cringe at the idea of stepping in the ring or the cage if you start associating that with a negative experience. Um there was a uh, a boxing coach, the Punch Professor, here on here on YouTube, and he uh, he was telling me a story. He used to train at um, at the same gym as Muhammad Ali back in the day, and he was he was commenting on how they would bring in sparring partners, and they would give the sparring partners really, really like comically big gloves, and they would give Muhammad Ali the the, the smaller gloves, and they would essentially pay these guys to get beaten up. Like these guys who weren't on the level of Ali, mm -hmm. not by a long shot, just to be like um, live punching bags. And this, this is not uncommon in boxing. Like Mike Tyson did this. He paid people mm -hmm. handsomely to get beat up by him. Mm -hmm. And the sports psychology behind that is to get them really comfortable with the idea of going full contact, not being afraid. They're not going to get hurt. They're in, cro in, in control of the situation. So when they get in the ring, they can do that exact same thing. And some people might say, well, well, they're they're fighting a world champion when they step in the ring. They're they're fighting a top ten contender. That's not the same. But the psychology is extremely powerful, of disassociating a negative experience from a fight. Yeah. Here's a question from you. I constantly get from the viewers, and I've fielded a few times, but I'd, I'd like your perspective on it, which is how to deal with with um, pre-fight nervousness, right? Before you get on the mat, before you, you compete in any level. I think all athletes uh, feel this to some degree, but combat sports athletes to an exceptional degree because there is that very, very real risk of serious injury. Mm -hmm. So as, as a wrestler, how, how would you recommend dealing with that? That's a good question. Um, how did I deal with nerves? I had bad pre-fight nerves, I did. Um, well... I'll do you well one is the warm-up get it on your warm-up that's usually one of the best ways to go about it uh, <clears throat> other ones lots of guys you will implement music into their warm-up routine uh. something that'll either get them so amped they can push through it or something that'll get them nice and relaxed it really depends it's at, it's case by case uh, besides that it's something you just kind of need to get used to to be honest some people can have the pressure some people can't yeah. Um, my experience about it is, yes, I did have pre-fight nerves all the time. Uh, I competed for a few provincial championships. I nationally medaled a few times, so I was on some big mats for and like during the final fights. So there'd be, of course, a crowd watching me too. And oh, what can I really say? You just you develop the mental dexterity for it. Uh, you need to def there's definitely a ritual that goes into it i guess the best way i can answer that is is through that you should develop a a ritual for yourself to help get prepare you for the mental for the mental state you're going into hmm. uh you know that's makes a lot of sense and like when i mean ritual i mean just get yourself into a meditative state and doing rituals do that now does that imply religion no it doesn't i, I myself am not that religious but i understand the the usefulness that comes to ritual it's that oh, yeah. it's absolutely it just makes sense it's just you're getting to a meditative state so uh that's what i would recommend yeah that that makes a lot of sense the first thing that made me think of was um there is a certain ritual that happens before each type of fight like in an mma fight 
right? As they get in the cage, the the announcer announces the fighters, here comes Ramsey Danger Dewey or whatever. Mm. And then the other guy, the referee calls the fighters to the center, gives last minute instructions, touch gloves if you want to, go back to your corner. Are you ready? Are you ready? Fight. And that that's the ritual of the beginning of the fight, right? And everybody's mm. used to that. When I had my first MMA fight here in China, it, it was in a boxing ring, which was a little different because all the other MMA fights were in a cage and the kickboxing matches were in a ring. Mm-hmm. And so that, that threw me off a little bit. The referee brings us out to the center, says something in Chinese I didn't understand. And then all of a sudden, a gong rings. Not, not, a, not a bell, but a gong. A and gong. the guy punches me in the face right there in the middle of the ring. And I, I'm like, what? I look at the referee. He's like, fight. And... <laughs> and it just took me out of my element because the ritual wasn't there. Yeah. Because in, in Sunda, anyway, they bring the fighters to the center. And right there, they're, they're like touching gloves distance. And the fight begins right there in the center. Okay. And so they brought that tradition over to MMA when MMA first started here. Now, now it's like the American ritual, you know. Back to your corner, come out to the center, you know, all that, mm. all that stuff. That wasn't the case. And man, that threw me off so much. One, because I didn't know what was going on. And two... I felt like, you know, you need that ritual to make you comfortable, to get you in the mindset, all right, now it's time to fight. Which, of course, is why so many people are, are just thrown out, out of the element, no matter how much they train, if they ever get assaulted violently on the streets or whatever. But, yeah, man, rituals. You ever, you ever watched a Muay Thai fight? Uh, I have, and you're talking about the traditional one where they go through yeah. like, the ritual. Yeah, of course. They have yeah, the epic it's... dance battle at the beginning with the music and it's the awesome. bowing, and yeah. they... they trace the the ring with their hands each fighter comes in it's yeah. it's very very ritualistic and i think there's a reason for that i think it does help and so yeah there's a re- and there that's just one example lots of fighting styles ancient, ancient fighting styles have some sort of ritualistic procedure and there's a reason for that like sumo is another good example of that throwing yeah. the salt and doing the doing the foot slams indeed e- even animals do this exactly like bighorn yeah. sheep man what do they do they bow to each other and then they raise up on their hind legs and then they go at it it's it's not a lengthy ritual but it is a ritual even animals exactly. do this lizards do the same thing so for your viewers who are competing who are doing yeah. like maybe jiu-jitsu tournaments wrestling tournaments i don't know what like golden gloves it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what style it doesn't matter what discipline is develop your own personal rituals they're based on you. They're based on your personality. For me, this is what I used to do. I used to... I didn't listen to music that much. But yeah. what I used to do is before matches, I usually prepared about three matches before mine. That was a good amount of hmm. time to get warm. And all I would simply do is I'd be around my mat. I would do footwork, some shadow wrestling. One of my teammates who was my size, one of my sparring partners come up, I would just do some light hand fighting and pummeling to get used to being in contact with somebody and besides that i would simply watch the matches in front of me you know i even comment on them as like oh that's a good shot it's like, oh, yeah. what was that going on? what really things like that uh the idea is i keep myself just engaged in the present moment i wouldn't be thinking about much beyond that yeah. And I would simply go as I would if I knew much about my opponent, I would go over some things in my head. It's like, well, they move this way usually, or they like to do these moves. That's about it. Or I would also be aware of with specific opponents, should I be more defensive? Should I be more offensive with them? Because depending on their style, I would either either need to be more engaging, be more aggressive, or I'd want to have a very strong defense. So just things like that. But mainly just staying in the present. And then what happened was I would be called. I would go to my corner about, I would go to my corner about uh, 30 seconds left in the match before mine. Or if I saw that the guy was about to get pinned or whatever, and I would, you know, strip down. Um, I didn't wear mouth guards that often. It's not really mm. required. <laughs> I just, Interesting. I was a savage. Anyway, uh, then I would just, you know, strap up my singlet to get my blood rag ready. And I would give myself smack on the thighs smack on the chest walk out to the center show my blood rag and i would actually pace yeah for those not in the know of what a blood rag is such as myself what is that blood rag it sounds it's, badass it's man. your blood rag you just stuff it in your singlet it's your blood rag in case you get cut open you just you know wipe okay. it off put it back in yeah ah so yeah. you keep that in yeah in just, the singlet during the match in the singlet during the match yeah. oh, okay or you can put it in your sock i just kept it in my singlet fascinating yeah wow i have learned something today 
I started wrestling as an adult, so man, I didn't have the blood rag experience. That's a that's a metal term right there. Yeah, and depending, I would usually pace. I would pace on the mat on my side. I'd just go back and forth, back and forth, waiting for the ref to be ready. And that's yeah. it. I mean, there's no really big stare downs or anything in wrestling. If anything, most wrestlers I've ever fought, they're extremely courteous, extremely sportsmen. So that's it. We keep to ourselves, and then when the whistle goes, we just go hard. Yeah, I think w one thing professional combat sports like MMA in particular, especially right now, tries to do is amp up the level of pre-fight anxiety. Mm. And, you know, if, if it's like a tournament format like wrestling, BJJ, often the first time you see the other guy is on the mat, right? But in MMA, you know, it's the day before you have the weigh-ins and the press conference and the stare down. And the UFC, man, they put out so many promotional materials for these fighters and uh, fighting here in China, man, it's it's interesting because they make the fighters go through all of these, all of these. I don't even know what to call them, like photo ops and and uh, interviews and all all this stuff, parading the fighters around before the fight, having them look at each other, pose next to their opponent. They have rehearsals right. about how they're going to do this before the match, and and it's like they keep that other guy constantly present in your mind. And so the level of anxiety can go through the roof if you don't have it that under control. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's a business, right? So they need to they need to add the theatrics into it. Yeah. I mean, this is why certain sports, especially, you know, Olympic combat sports, they just, they're not that attractive. I mean, a big thing that makes pro boxing pro boxing, a big thing that makes UFC UFC is the theatrics of it. And that's really that, that's really this, how simple as it gets. So, yeah. And to be honest, we'd all be lying if we don't like it. I mean, I do like the entertainment aspect of UFC. Yeah. I mean, that's the truth. Every time I see somebody who's the heel, I mean, you, you got to love it. Either you're for them or you just want to see them knocked out. It's one or the other usually. Yeah, yeah. man. I, I love that concept of the ritual because everybody is, everybody is so different. Like I've coached a lot of fighters and they all wanted to warm up differently. They all, mm -hmm. like there was no magic formula that made it work for everybody. Mm. There was this dude named Travis, Travis Timmerman, tough, tough guy, heavyweight, had knockout power in both hands, that kind of guy. But he would never warm up before the fights. He, he just wanted to sit there backstage quietly by himself and think. And he would just stare ahead of him for like 30 minutes. That, that was his ritual. That's his ritual. That's his ritual. Yeah. And, and, you know, other guys, they want to warm up extensively. They want to hit pads for like 30 minutes. They want to go in there just hot and sweaty. And, and uh, that's their ritual. And other guys, you know, pace around. I knew this dude, he, he would sit backstage and read the Bible. That's all he would do. He'd read the Bible, then he'd go out and knock people out. He was good at it, too. Impressive. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like this uh, this um, very different type of preparation that works for different type of people. So, man, that's, that's some of the best advice I've heard, quite honestly. Give yourself a ritual, something that you can fall back on, something that works specifically for you. Well, I think that's where it really comes down to. So many of these people that give you comments in your sections and some of your own students, you know, there's things like, what makes me a good fighter? It's like, well, it's a holistic approach. You have to have athletic training. So you have to actually do things beyond the mat. You have yeah. to do weightlifting. You have to do, you know, maybe some sort of form of stretching. Some You have to follow certain recovery methods. You have to have very specific diets. That's the physical side. And then also there is... A mental side and you need to find ways for you to channel channel and become stronger in your mental focus or develop your mental health yeah because if you're this is it's very holistic if you don't have this and you're not going to be an effective fighter hmm. yeah you know i was reading today speaking of recovery something that kind of blew my mind uh you know the rice formula rest ice compression elevation yeah something that every every athlete every trainer every everybody has heard this forever. Mm -hmm. If you have an injury, rest it, put ice on it, compress it, elevate it. The guy who came up with the rice formula um, fairly recently has come out saying, let's take ice out of the equation. Hmm. Yeah. And that, that shocked me. I was like, why? It reduces the swelling. His, his justification for that was that ice essentially makes you feel better temporarily. It, it helps take the pain away it masks the symptoms but what you really need to do for long-term recovery is replace the ice with movement to mm. increase circulation and this kind of blew my mind a little bit like but 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 we've been doing that forever it's tradition 
And so I've been thinking about this all morning, like, man, what's the rice? Ele- what is it now? The mice thing? I don't know. No, rest. We're changing ice. Okay. Ice is now movement, apparently. Like gentle movement that doesn't aggravate the injury, but keeps you moving and keeps the blood moving, okay. is, uh, is his new recommendation. Hmm. Oh. So what do you think of that? I think, well, I like to think um, this fellow, obviously he's a kinesiologist, eh? I, I don't know what his um, specialty is, but let's put it this way: I always, I always put myself at the um, at the mercy of experts. Let's put it that yeah. way, especially experts that you know have the academic background and uh, and ability to redevelop their ideas. I mean, I don't see why it's not possible for things to change. Why not? I mean, training yeah. changes all the time, especially th- within physical science and kinesiology. It is is a scientific process. You test one thing, see if it works for a while, great. But then you can always challenge the theory. That's the whole point. Yeah. <laughs> so I have no problem with it. Uh, myself, I don't ice that much personally. I don't. I do rest. I do elevate. But personally, I never iced. Not because I didn't believe in icing. Not, not. I'm, this isn't like an aha moment. Like I knew it. No, yeah. I never knew it. But I just never really did that much. Why? Well, because I'm lazy and I don't want to put ice in the freezer. <laughs> yeah, man, I've I've done this so much. A lot of my old students, my my former students who hear me, who are so familiar with me preaching rest, ice, compression, elevation, are probably listening to this right now. Like, what? How can you? How can you go back on this? You made me put ice on this injury for hours and hours, and I hated every moment of it. And and now you're saying the opposite. I'm well. The thing is, I'm saying I don't know. I just heard the expert who came up with that time-tested, um, trusted methodology going back on what he said. Yeah, they're coming out. People who work in sports science, people who work in kine- kinesiology. I mean, the great thing about this is these are sciences, and people don't really think about that because they think it's you know sport. Oh, a man, jump up and down. It's like, well, no, man's jumping up and down at what velocity due to the amount of his muscle mass and at what speed based on yeah. formulas of gravity. Like, do I know how to do this? No, I don't. But I'm smart enough to know that I can depend on an expert telling me whether they figured out something based on the data they've collected. And the best part about this is I also understand that if you follow the scientific theorem, things will change. So you really shouldn't be um, orthodox in your in your um, in your training regimen if new evidence from respectable bodies says otherwise. I mean, it's perfectly fine to accept them. Don't you know put on a tinfoil hat and say that you know people oh they're lying to us oh they knew all along. It's like well why what would be the what would be the benefit of them you know changing that yeah man conspiracy theorists man we were talking a little bit about conspiracy theorists before this uh this podcast i've, I've had a bunch of people ask me uh not so much ask but make assertions about um about this coronavirus situation right now in the world saying mm. vehemently with all kinds of sources cited this is a hoax and i'm thinking okay if this was a hoax like everybody would have to be in on it like there would be more people in on it than not exactly um and they they often ask well do you know anybody with the coronavirus now i know a lot of people who say that they know people i don't know anybody directly because you know i've been inside neither do for three i months. Yeah. but um yeah man it's it's so interesting that everybody is out to to disprove the situation to say it's it's the governments of the world collaborating against us to control us and all of this and Global currency, man, Illuminati. Yeah. Yeah, yeah look into yeah. it. Look, look into it. You don't know, man. You don't know. You don't know. I think it's ridiculous. Um, that's just my honest opinion. Yeah, I man. don't see how it's beneficial to anyone, any group. That shut envi- down the that world economy. Shut down the world economy. It yeah. just makes no... Now, what you should ask me is, are certain governments going to take advantage of this situation all that's occurred of course yeah there's going to be new types of diplomacy there's going to be loans given out to places that are heavily hit that's what happened after world war ii yeah but what what the really the big point is nobody started a virus to cripple the global economy that's a ridiculous concept yeah this is something that I think everybody should pay attention to is that, yeah, certain people, even certain malicious people will always 
find ways to benefit from bad situations. But you know what? Everybody should find ways to make their own lives better in, in situations like this. I mean, take a cue from the bad guys in this situation. Mm-hmm. They're doing everything they can to profit from this situation. Why aren't you doing everything that you can to make your life better? during this time. I mean, so many of you are at home thinking, oh, boo-hoo, I'm stuck at home for months. What am I going to do? Remember all those times in your life where you said, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this. Well, there you go. Now you got time. You got that gift of time. Yeah. I mean, I spent, besides doing my restructuring my training regimen, which was already a part of my life, I just, I focused more on my Chinese again. Simple. Uh, Now, like I already speak Chinese, okay? Made it better can understand a lot more now. So there you go. And, and that's interesting. Being stuck at home, not out there, communicating with all kinds of people on the regular, I'm guessing, and still improving improving language skills. Yeah. Also, um, cooking skills. I know everybody pretty much is learning how to bake at this point. I've been seeing posts My everywhere. wife, man. My wife, she didn't cook basically at all before this. She has become an excellent cook in the last three months. There you go. It is amazing. Yeah. And I already cooked well. Now I'm just cooking better. I'm making uh, some nice beef chucks. I'm making some briskets, you know, uh, making curries every few, few weeks. I made my first batch of cookies. They came out great. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Congratulations. A bacon chocolate chip. <laughs> it's actually a fantastic combo. Bacon and chocolate chip. Oh, interesting. I recommend interesting. it. Interesting. My, my vegan viewers are probably scratching their eyes out like, no. I know I have quite a few of those. Well, vegan viewers, why don't you, <laughs> you know, make a really tasty vegan dish you know share it with yours truly and i'll give it a shot so yeah there you go yeah nobody has to fight over it sorry let's all be friends come on guys (laughs) but bacon and chocolate that's a it's good that's like um something i would expect to come out of like the southeast u.s as opposed to from our friends from the canadian north i think i learned it from actually know where i got it from i one thing i did do at the beginning of this uh, at the beginning of this epidemic is when I was stuck inside, I finally watched Breaking Bad because I never got into it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it's brilliant. I, I'm really sorry to all my friends. I was wrong. I, I owe you an apology. It's a good show. But that's, yeah. a, that's a strange show to explain to a friend who's never seen it because somebody was explaining the plot to me and I was like, why do I want to watch a show about a, a guy who makes meth? That, I, I don't get it, man. And I start watching the show and I'm like, oh, I get it now because of the storytelling, the way they, they yeah. uh, the story unfolds. It's it's interesting. It's it's well presented. It's it puts you in the shoes of the bad guy. Mm-hmm. It, it's so interesting. Like you know the the wife in that show, Skyler. Yeah. Skyler, yes. Everybody hates her because she's telling the bad guy not to be bad, basically, because she's essentially the good guy, but she's not the protagonist. The the uh, the bad guy is the protagonist in the show. The good guys are the antagonists. It flips the script a little bit. It's like if you took Star Wars and you had the exact same story except told it from the point of view of Darth Vader. Who is Darth Vader? He is this guy. He's had some... He suffered some serious wrongs in his life. The the Jedi have spurned him. He got his arms and legs chopped off by his former best friend, who now has essentially stolen his own son and turned him against him. Mm-hmm. So Darth Vader's own son has been turned against him by a bunch of a bunch of religious fanatics out in the desert trying to destroy the legitimate government. And and you know Darth Vader's trying to win his son back to to his side basically okay you frame it like that suddenly it's a very compelling story we can relate to it we're on Darth Vader's side now if you know you point the cameras in the right direction mm-hmm. yeah the medium is the message <laughs> that's yeah, funny man. but no i actually agree with you and it's just anyway long segue there was an episode in Breaking Bad yeah. where a lawyer bribes a bank teller with bacon chocolate chip cookies. Uh, if he's able to bribe that fat lady, oh, I'm sure yeah. it's got to be good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was in there. Yeah. So he's like, okay, I got to try that. So I looked it up, put it together, easy. Interesting. Yeah. And and they weren't they weren't gross because I'm hearing like meat and cookies and the same thing. It's like, I like meat. I like bacon. I like cookies. 
but I wouldn't think of putting them together. Oh, yeah, they're great. Next one I'm going to do is I'm going to make black bottom cupcakes. My mother used to make them when I was a child. Yeah. They're cream cheese chocolate cupcakes. Interesting. Again, weird combination. Works. Cream cheese and chocolate. That that works. I mean, there's chocolate cheesecake. People like that. Yeah. That, that seems normal. But if you had, like, I don't know, bacon cheesecake, somebody out there is going to do that. I bet. That's, that's just that's too much for me. Uh, that's just out there, in my opinion. Who knows? Who knows? I'm willing to try raciated diabetes. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh, other things. Oh, I tried different diets during the epidemic. Okay. I did fasting. Uh, I've kind of switched out of it now, but I did fast for two months. Two months straight? Two months or straight. Like yeah, I did a, I did a 16, 8, 17, 5 fast. So okay, like an inter intermittent, intermittent fasting, fasting schedule? Okay. Intermittent fast, okay. yeah. Sorry, not a fast. No. <laughs> No, I'm yeah, not yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm not Gandhi, guys. <laughs> anyway, so... I was about uh, to say, two months fast, that's like, man, that's like Jesus level, man. Yeah, right. Anyway, uh, so I did that. I did intermittent fasting, and that went pretty well. I went from a 34 waist to a 32. Oh, interesting. It is interesting. It's actually, it's very interesting, because uh, this whole time I did a good fast, and I did calorie counting the whole time. And I also engaged in running. And for the first month, I switched over because I can't lift heavy. I, yeah. went, I went to long distance running and I did finish a half marathon after three weeks of training. I did. Really? Yeah, I did 25 kilometers in one day in one go. So yeah, yeah. I've, I've noticed you, you post your, your running schedule sometimes on, on social media. I yeah. follow that sometimes like, man, he's running a lot. Yeah. Like around your apartment complex. Yeah, well, I used to run when I was a kid. My father used to do long distance uh, running races, and I played rugby since I was a very young boy. So, okay. um, running's always, even though I am very large, running's always very natural to me, and my uh, actual running um, posture and my my form is okay, you know. So, you know, just after a few weeks, I was able to do it again. Uh, yeah. That was the longest I've gone in one go. I'll probably do a marathon length at some point, but yeah, it was good. And what I found is this so, um, I did lose inches on the waist, but I didn't lose any actual weight. Hmm. Um, I'm at a 32 waist, but I'm at 105 kilograms. So I'm just so you started at 105, still 105. Yeah, just steady. body composition changed. Body composition changed, yeah. Yeah, my, my wife's going through this as well because uh, she basically didn't pay much attention to fitness until until this um, this epidemic came out. We're stuck at home, and she's like, you know what? I'm going to exercise. Yeah. And her weight is very similar to what it was, but her proportions are radically different. She was prating around the house in her old jeans yeah. from three months ago, holding the waist out to like, you know, out there like, look, look, I've shrunk, but I weigh the same. What's happening? She was confused at it. Yeah, it's just muscle mass. Like, this is a American large shirt. It's not XL. It's large American. Okay. And these jeans, they're a little big, actually. These are 34 I'm wearing today, but I am at a 32 waist. So, yeah. Hmm. There you go. 32. Yeah. Wow. Cool, man. Yeah. The only other thing is hair length. I am paranoid <laughs> about going to the barber, so this is the longest my hair's ever been. Yeah. And I may just let it keep growing at this point. I've given up. I man, know. If, if I had hair, if I could grow hair like you, man, I, I would have long flowing <laughs> lion's mane going on. It would be it, like... It is a mane. It would be I, glorious. I, I wake up, I got a fro just popping out. I have to use so much product to keep it steady. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And then I had a big beard beforehand, but my wife got tired of it, so I shaved it off for her. What what is it with wife's hating beards? My wife hates my beard every day. I, I shave about uh, once every three weeks, every four weeks, mm -hmm. which confuses a lot of uh, a lot of my YouTube viewers, especially when they subscribe. They're like, "Yeah, this bearded guy. Where did his beard go?" And then it comes back, and they're like, "Okay, I, I get it." But the new guys are always like, "Where did your beard go? Where did your beard go? Wait, you used to be clean, clean shaven. Now you have a beard." That's not even your most pretty fast. That's not even your most distinctive feature. I say it's the bald dude with a soothing voice. <laughs> you know, he's she's like a human quaalude, guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I get that a lot. The voice, the voice. And then all these folks are are saying things like, um, this is a comment I get multiple times every day, like, why do you use that fake voice? Kids, the saying is fake voice. <laughs> yeah, man, it's uh it, it's shocking to me. It makes me laugh every time I hear it. Like, whoa, 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 stop doing that fake voice. I hate your fake voice. You really should be like either on Smooth, da smooth Jazz a AM or maybe some like PBS, PBS radio or something like that. NPR radio. Oh, you'd man. Be, you know what I would love to right do? Well there. <laughs> I would love to be the new David Attenborough. <laughs> I would love to do animal documentaries. And now, observe the brown bear in its native environment. And that's all I've got right now because I don't have a script. So... But, man, nature documentaries, I would love to be a nature documentary 
voiceover guy. That would be amazing. That'd be pretty sweet. I have no idea how to get into that gig. People always say, hey, Ramsey, have you ever thought about doing voiceovers? I'm like, yeah, I've done some, but you actually have to find a job first, and you got to know people to do that. Yeah, it's mainly who you know. Well, here anyway. Actually, it's very funny that you say that. My sister is an actress, and that's her actual job. Like, She gets yeah. paid to do commercials and voiceover and stuff. And where she's from is in Quebec, and it's all unionized. She had to join a literal union hmm. Interesting. to act. So it's like, wow, that's interesting. So it's part of the actors' union to do like yeah, but it's also and things? it's also okay. a law there. You have to ah. join a union. So it's like, what? <laughs> yeah, I think um, as, as far as like uh, what is it? The Screen Actors Guild in the in the United States covers like certain things. Uh, it was a little confusing. I remember I was watching this movie and like people who are who do not belong to the Screen Actors Guild, they can't have any spoken lines. If they have a spoken line, then they have to have a a, a SAG card. Screen Actors Guild card. There was a, what was that movie? Being John Malkovich. Have you seen that yes, one? Yes, I've seen that. A great film. There was a scene, an unintentional scene that got filmed. Um, John Malkovich is walking along the side of the road. A guy runs uh, or drives his truck by. He's not supposed to be in the movie. He just drives by, throws something at him. Oh yeah, he says Malkovich, scream- you suck. Yeah, screams uh. Malkovich, you suck out the window. They wanted to keep the the scene in the movie, so they had to hunt the guy down, get him a Screen Actors Guild card, and so that guy, even though like that's his only scene in Hollywood, to to my knowledge, that's is part of the Screen Actors Guild. So he had funny. to be in order to keep it in the in the film. That's brilliant. Uh, yeah. So that's really it. Those are things you do in epidemics, guys. I mean, I know lots of people are are dissatisfied with staying at home, but I mean. There's no really any other way around this. You're going to be. This is what's probably going to happen over the next few months. You're yeah. going to stay at home now. The virus is going to die down. Then you're going to have a few weeks or months of normalcy, and uh, probably a few months of normalcy in the summertime. And then you're going to have another flare up, and this where you'll have to isolate again. And this will be a repetitive cycle until they have a vaccine. Yeah, most likely. Yeah. Like that's really it. You're this isn't our last time in isolation until this vaccine is made. So that's it. Indeed. So those folks at home who are doing those uh, those at home workouts, that's that's not just a temporary fix. Make that a uh, make that a life habit. Yeah. Now there's some there's so many things you can do though. I mean, if you get yeah. bored, just change up the routine. I mean, do P ninety X, why not? Or maybe, I don't know, take up yoga or do something meditative or learn chess. Mm. Like there's so many things you can do to hold up your time. I mean, you should take this as an opportunity to develop disciplines, to develop meditative states. I can tell you now, probably of any other time in my life, my mental health has never been better. And I've always had pretty good mental health, but especially now, it's just so strong. Yeah. yeah. I, well, yeah. Let's talk about those two things, uh, meditation and fasting, because those are two things I get asked about a lot. And you, you mentioned you started fasting during this thing. I, th- throughout my life, I've fasted for religious reasons. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't until recently that I attempted long-term fasting for non-religious reasons, basically just to see what it was like, see what would physiologically happen. Oh, okay. And yeah, it uh, it was interesting. Like like what shocked me the most was that after two days of of fasting, not eating, I was doing like the, um, the non-religious fast, a water fast, eating, drinking salt water and no food at all, mm. salt water to keep the electrolytes up. So I didn't start spasming or anything like that. Mm. And it was shockingly easy. After the first two days, the first two days, it's like, ah, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. I feel hunger, I feel weak. Mm. And then, you know, after, after day two, it's like, yeah, this isn't so bad. I could keep this up for a while. Um, meditation. I'm constantly asked, do you meditate? And the word can be defined a few different ways if we go with the, most, the simplest definition. It's just th- to think deeply about something. And if you're not thinking deeply about anything, change that up and start meditating in that sense immediately. But uh, how, how do you meditate? Meditate? Well, I think everybody meditates and they just don't understand that they are. Like, my idea of what meditation is, it's not really thinking deeply, but it's it is thinking deeply, but what I yeah. mean by that is meditation is simply focusing your my, your mind to, on something, like having extreme fixation on something, putting everything to the front of your mind. So you're doing it through action. 
So anything can be meditation, you know. You can think about the traditional sense where like as a monk or like a yogi, just in a stance, you know, crisscross applesauce. That's what everybody likes to think. But really, that's just one perspective of meditation. I mean, I was raised Catholic. Catholic monks doing the rosary beads. That's meditation. Doing a rosary is meditation. You're going through mm. each section of the bead through meditative trance, focusing strictly on a prayer in which you're hoping to have some spiritual enlightenment. That is a form of meditation. The Muslims do it too. They have their own prayer necklaces. That's meditation. Also doing their, their, um, their ritual of continuous prayer through the day. That's meditation. That is meditation. Right. Buddhists do that too. You know, evangelicals do that too in their own way. And, you know, it's just, and that's just a religious standpoint. There's other ways to meditate. How do I meditate myself these days? I lift weights. When All I'm right. lifting a weight, I'm not thinking about anything else except focusing on the weight and the motion that I'm going up and down, up and down. That, that's interesting you mentioned that. I, I love the term moving meditation. Mm -hmm. Like some of the most popular videos I have on YouTube, I filmed them in the, uh, the weight room of the old gym over at the JX Fight Club immediately after lifting weights. Because for some reason, like that, that was the time I, I would, when I lifted, I would just focus on, on the lifting. I wouldn't think about the questions I was going to answer. I just knew in the back of my mind, I was going to answer some people's questions afterward. Mm -hmm. And right after I lifted the weights, I set up my camera and just started recording. And there was an immense clarity in those moments. Yes. Yeah, there's this clarity. And, and for some reason, those videos are the ones that resonated the most with people. And... Maybe it had something to do with, I mean, obviously it had something to do with that. I mean, when, when you were able to focus like that, not just, you know, with your mental energies, but with your physical energies, it increases the quality of what you do. It increases the quality of how you can speak and communicate. Yeah. So, man, that's tremendous. Lifting weights, moving meditation. I love that. It is. And it's absolutely true. And it's the same with somebody who shadow boxes forever or who does shadow wrestling forever. Or if you're doing yoga, everybody. So let's put it this way. You, you associate yoga with meditation, but not weightlifting. But yoga is a physical exercise. You yeah. are adding physical pressure to your body. It is, it is, it is a dynamic movement exercise. You are, so it's got to be associated. Both of them have to be connected. And that's just physical. And we've only discussed physical and religious. There's other things too. A painter. Paint a picture. That's meditation. You go all Bob Ross. That's, that's med that is meditation. How oh, is yeah, it not? Man. Bob Ross. Yeah. Meditation master right there. Exactly. Like you ever met anybody more chill than Bob Ross? It's because that dude was painting 24-7. Making happy trees. Like... Happy uh, tree. little trees. Yeah. We're gonna make a That's what this tree. painting needs. This is going to be our secret, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, come on. I mean, there's there's obviously a reason for this. And the problem is a lot of people don't make that association. They don't, they don't, put, the, they don't put it together. They don't seem to realize that certain things are a meditative state. Like doing, uh, doing cross-stitching, whatever. What is it? Strip stitching or what is it called? Um, yeah, cross-stitching. Yeah, cross-stitching. Or... That's meditation. You're making, you're making art. Yeah, crocheting. Yeah. Man, crocheting, my grandma, it, yeah. my grandma would crochet. She would do it so quickly, yeah. and she she only had one functioning hand. Her right hand, she had a, most of it chopped off except the thumb. Jeez. In uh, an accident when she was a teenager working at a plywood factory, but she would just sit down and somehow, with one functioning hand and one thumb, crochet an afghan within an afternoon, wow. like an entire entire blanket. And I would just look at her think, how? How? She would just get into this very zen state where she was able to do this complex task quickly and enjoy it tremendously. Exactly. And that's the whole purpose of meditation is to clear your mind. Yeah. And allow for you to re-enter your present situation with a better perspective on how to solve a problem or how to go after a problem or how to move forward with the rest of your day. That is all meditation is. So dude playing golf, that's a good example. Golf is yeah. meditation. It's yeah. a, a word I like to use is unplug from the world, if you will. Yes. And there, there are different ways to do that. Like uh, one thing I love to do is just go on a walk. Yeah. Like, like sometimes, um, another example of the most popular YouTube videos I have came after I went on a walk. Like I walked for 30 minutes, didn't listen to any music, no phone, no outside influences. Just walk and be 
alone with my my thoughts, my body, myself, my breathing. Hmm. Not try to think about anything. To just go, and then and then afterwards come back and sit down and answer somebody's question, and suddenly it really resonates with people on this deeper level. So I should probably do that more often since my more recent YouTube videos have not been doing um, as well as far as the, the sheer numbers. But <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll give that a try. Hint yeah. to YouTubers out there, meditate. Well, yeah, I mean, if I would recommend anything, it's that. Now, the thing is, there's no reason why they can't go together. You're, why you can't um, have your mental and physical health go together when you're doing activities. So, yeah. yeah, that's what I recommend. And your your mind is your body. Your body is your mind, mm -hmm. in so many ways. I mean, I'm not trying to solve the hard problem of consciousness here, and say that the uh, you know our brains light up because our consciousness acts, or our consciousness acts because our brains light up. But um, but there is definitely a connection between what is going on physiologically and what is happening mentally, Absolutely. and it should not be ignored. Absolutely. Like, I mean, most, um, I know a lot of influencers, ones that at least I follow a lot, they really credit their success to their ability to have, to their strong mental dexterity. So, for example, Jocko Willick and mm. David Goggins, those guys both say, strong mind, strong body. It's really what it comes down to. And, you know, if you're able to apply that, you will usually have better outcomes, especially in crisis situations like now. Yeah, Jocko has some really good advice for the folks stuck at home going stir crazy with cabin fever. Absolutely. I mean, he, he's a guy who's um, just very disciplined, very regimented and scheduled. And then when that schedule was taken away, he essentially said, give yourself a modified schedule. There you go. He's saying, don't don't take this as an excuse to roll out of bed in at noon instead of waking up at 4 a.m. or whatever he does. Super early riser. But rather... Uh, some things will have to change. Like right now, he, he's at home, he's helping his kids with his schoolwork and all, the, all that that he was not doing before. That has to happen. That's now part of his schedule. And so he works out in the afternoon as opposed to super early in the morning. But he still gets up super early Yeah. to get stuff done. I mean, that's something that doesn't have to change. Yeah, and that's the thing. So now is the opportunity for you to do things that you feel will benefit both you and your family. Now, some things I would recommend you don't do while in quarantine. First yeah. one is drink i really mm. now let's put it this way i'm not opposed to alcohol i'm not a teetotaler but at the same time it just makes sense to me if you are drinking while isolated and especially if you are alone and doing it alcohol is depressive you drink more than one you keep going it's just going to create a continuous depressive state interesting so, so i really recommend to actually have very clean living while you're isolated avoid alcohol avoid junk food avoid um narcotics like and when i i don't know what i mean to to find by narcotics i'm from canada so i mean one cannabis is legal again not against cannabis not against it at all but at the same time i wouldn't be doing it regularly if i'm in isolation yeah that that makes sense i mean i'm i don't drink alcohol or any of that stuff for a lot of reasons personal religious so that's very interesting hearing that from from a more secular perspective because mm -hmm. yeah those those are mood altering substances and a lot of people are depressed right now. And one of the worst things you can do when, when there's depression is trying to self-medicate in an unprofessional yeah. way like that to alter your mood in exactly. a way that's temporary. Exactly. And I mean self-medication always. You, like, don't get me wrong, I still do things like I eat cookies and stuff like that. But here's the thing, I'm not buying the store-bought cookies. I'm measuring and baking my own cookies. Yeah. Uh, I also... Cookies are the new crack, folks. There you go. Pretty much. And the old man got some of those cookies. <laughs> anyway, um, things like that. Like, I don't really eat that much junk food. Uh, I eat a lot of food. I'm a big man. But almost all the food I eat... Pretty, no, actually, since this time, I've only eaten out once. And that's it. Mm. Uh, in fact, every single meal I've made, my wife and I have cooked it. And we know the measurements and we make sure we add lots of vegetables and we have an adequate amount of carbs because I have returned carbs back in my diet since then because I just calorie count now instead. Hmm. And what I've noticed is uh, this, when I have tried some food outside or when I have treated myself to junk food, it's ended poorly. Uh, for example, the day after I finished my mat half marathon, I decided to treat myself. I got myself some McDonald's chicken. 
because the fried chicken that they actually make here in China at McDonald's is fantastic. It yeah. tastes great and it's spicy. It's yeah, they've great. got fried chicken at McDonald's in China. Yeah. Fried chicken, th- this might surprise a lot of people, is a very, very popular fast food dish among mm-hmm. the Chinese. Yeah, and they make it nice and spicy and it's good. So we got a bucket of that, ate that, you know, veg for a day, let my body recover. Next day, went for a run. My body felt like garbage, like I was hungover. Yeah. I hadn't experienced something like that for all oh, my joints were swollen. It wasn't just because of the running. It was not just my legs. It was other parts of my body. Yeah. And it was and the reason why I know it just wasn't from the run is because I ate clean that day and then the next day, so within like a three day period, my body was completely fine the next day. My energy levels were good. I wasn't lethargic. So I know there was a correlation between the junk food because I was eating so clean beforehand and then suddenly having it. Oh yeah, there absolutely is. When you man, when when you live clean for an extended period of time and then you experience the the stark contrast like mm-hmm. that, man, the stark contrast is painful sometimes. Oh yeah. Like man, I don't know, what what can I relate this to? It's um yeah, man, it's a, it's it's a powerful contrast. <laughs> My mind just drew a blank. Man, that's a terrible thing to do in a podcast, but that, that's such a tremendous point right there. It's interesting you mentioned that, the, that there was inflammation in the joints because uh, fried, fried foods, generally fried in, uh, in sat, not saturated fat, polyunsaturated fats, okay. um, that type of stuff actually is an inflammatory, causes inflammation. Really? Like, yeah, oh, like certain foods, certain foods are anti-inflammatory, certain foods are inflammatory. Okay. So like um, a lot of oils, a lot of like vegetable type of oils, uh, corn oil, that sort of thing, ca- can cause uh, inflammation. That's generally what uh, yeah. what um, oh, that's, chicken is fried in or hydro. Especially oil. here, yeah. They yeah. Definitely fry in a corn oil. Yeah. Whereas other foods like turmeric, um, what else? Uh, butter, just like uh, fresh, real butter, not margarine, but, yeah. but butter saturated fats like that can actually help reduce inflammation that's great and i cook with butter a lot yeah i keep um before i was having my uh before i cut out carbs i was almost keeping almost a ketogenic diet but it wasn't ketosis so yeah i found that Mm. at that point my joints were feeling quite good but now i include carbs i'm running a lot so i'm perfectly fine with it and then i just instead of you know and because i'm and then now i just simply calorie count because i run about 10 kilometers a day at my weight, that's about a thousand calories. Yeah. So simply, I just try to eat two thousand calories. That's well, it. Well, let's talk about the keto diet for a minute. I did a few podcasts with Ned about that, and where we were very much like, "Keto is bad. Don't do it." And we got <laughs> we got a bunch of backlash. And I I, I tried it for a while. Mm. I tried it for a while because I I don't want to come from a place uh, of ignorance, uh, telling people about it just just to see how I personally feel, and. Um, honestly, I, I didn't have the, the energy levels that I normally do. Mm. Uh, it was, it was fairly short term, but, uh, but my energy levels were low. My, my lifts were much lower. My endurance was much lower. That, that was my personal experience. So, um, it's not something from my perspective I, I would recommend for, to, to most athletes, but what, what was your experience like? Uh, I wouldn't say I went into full ketosis. I didn't. So let's make that clear now, guys. I didn't. Uh, but I did keep it pretty strict for like a month and a half, two months. Okay. Uh, but I broke it in these senses. I ate nuts. I like hmm. nuts. Don't want to get rid of nuts. Stay away from my nuts. I want them. Anyway, uh, so in the Chinese make really good uh, nut snacks here. So that's my cheat. That's what I programmed my brain into thinking is my cheat meal. So okay. I like them. Uh, and also, I would eat fruit once in a while. Like those were my energy boosts but uh i usually kept pretty strict and what i found is yes i didn't have good energy for a while but what i found is i did adapt over time and then when i did inject carbs into my body i felt a huge spike in energy Hmm. huge spike it was just crazy interesting so what uh what types of carbs did you introduce uh what did i introduce i just introduced rice once in a while that was really it like my wife's chinese we ate we eat rice just plain white rice yeah plain white rice um, but usually just lots of, uh, mainly fruit, to be honest. When I was doing the keto thing, my main carb was fruit. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think 
if you're doing like a lot of long, slow distance type stuff, like like distance running, uh, I, I can see how that, that could really work out. Um, but so, something more explosive, like, uh, I don't, I don't know, what, what was probably the most explosive uh, energy demanding exercise you did during that time frame? Well, that's a good question. I think it was honestly, uh, when I was doing cycles for calisthenics, I was doing a uh, high-end calisthenic uh, cycle exercise. So I would start doing, like, for example, my chest day, I would do, I would go through five cycles and I would start by doing 70 push-ups. Then I would immediately go do uh, 20 dips on the dip bar. Then I would go do uh, 15 to 20 um, incline decline sorry decline and then i would do 15 20 incline and then i would do 15 one arm each arms and then i would do some ab exercises and then i would rest and then i would rest for two three minutes and then i do another cycle and i do five cycles yeah uh the running not so bad i mean once you get into a running state if you have good form it does not, nothing really hurts your energy your yeah. energy if your energy runs out you just end up walking <laughs> that's really it <laughs> <laughs> oh man we are Built to walk forever, man. But yeah, that that's interesting. The the first time I did a podcast with Ned, we were we were very anti ketogenic diet, and the second time Ned, he he had uh, a bit of a change of heart. He said essentially the most positive thing about a diet like that, or, or really not any diet, but any well regimented diet, mm. is the factor of compliance. That some people need something like that, like they need a schedule. Which is, again, why this quarantine is throwing so many people off, because it takes their schedule away. Yeah. But one of the big bonuses of, of keto and, and, and a number of those other popular diets is they give people a schedule, if you will, a regiment that they have to strictly follow. And when you introduce the element of compliance like that, then you can start to experience success, essentially. If you do something consistently, then you will get a result, whether that's good or bad, but you will get a result. Yeah. And this thing with uh, diets too is the most important thing when it comes to physical training. And you know, the influencers I listen to all have the same mantra. Everybody's body is different. Everybody's results will be different to certain regimens or routines or diets hmm. so for me did the ketogenic diet really work that much for me not so much i actually got a lot of my physical um transformation done when i simply switched to a 16 8 intermittent fast and i started calorie counting hmm. and that was specifically for me i just burned off more than i ate and that worked for me will that work for everyone no it won't it will not work for everyone so don't just think oh the man on the internet skybox said this so it must work no that's not how it works you uh, have to actually experiment on yourself and you have to give it time to see if it does work so i'm not saying do it for a week do it for at least a month to two months okay you need to give your body time to adjust to the diet to adjust to the routine and if it doesn't work back to the drawing board and don't get dissuaded by that don't get bummed this is the process this is how you figure out how to rebuild yourself yeah this is a uh, mental trap i think a lot of people can fall into seeing the guy on the internet or seeing this successful sports person or whatever it is and thinking if i do exactly what they do i will get the same result and that's certainly not always the case i mean there was a video I made a while back about uh, a day of eating that I did because people were asking, and this was when I was eating oh, a I lot, that, yeah. like a lot. I was eating like six meals a day, like thousands and thousands of calories a day uh, because my goal was to put on weight. I was a skinny guy trying to bulk up. Mm. And so I was eating this inordinate amount of calories. So I said, okay, right now this, this is what I'm eating. And it's a lot. And I got this message from this guy saying, I'm going to eat that exact same diet. And I'm like, uh, yeah. you might not want to. He's like, but why? You're eating it. I'm like, you are not me. Exactly. We're different people with different goals. Like, yeah. my goal is put on, put on weight. Your goal may not be that. Yeah. Like, and it's, that's exactly, and that's the difference between your physiology. It's like, you were eating thousands of calories and you were having difficulty putting on weight. I reduce my calorie intake. It doesn't matter. I keep a lot of my volume. Like, yeah. I keep a lot of it. I haven't been under 100 kilograms for years. So, yeah. Yeah, it's really I mean, that simple. There's so many people out there. If they followed, like if they ate every day what I was eating there or something comparable calorically, they would be morbidly obese. Yeah. In yeah. fact, I got a lot of comments like that. Like, why are you not fat? How, 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 how is that possible? 
Yeah. Again, everybody's different. Everybody's different. Something we've heard since childhood, but have a hard time internalizing as adults for some reason. There you go. Yeah. So yeah, that's why I recommend. That's uh, and that's the big reason why I want to talk to you today on the podcast. I feel like a lot of people just they really are taking the approach to this isolation all wrong. They really yeah. should look at it as an advantage. Yeah. yeah. See the glass as all the way full instead of all the way empty, my friends. That's how the saying goes, right? Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's true. It is a matter of perspective. Man, I I actually got kind of excited. I felt like these butterflies in my stomach when this whole thing started. I was like, oh, this is going to be interesting. There are going to be some changes. And a lot of people are terrified of the changes. I know I understand that I, I have been in that boat before. But I'm thinking, you know what? There, there are going to be some changes Everything's going to be different. The world's going to be different. But I'm excited about the new world, essentially. I am too. I, the reality is, from my observation of human history, lots of bad things happen. But we're moving up and up. You know, we keep moving up the ladder in a positive direction. So just yeah. look at it from that viewpoint. This is what's going to basically happen. After all this is said is done, after a vaccine is solved, which there will be one, the economy is going to be in shambles. There's going to be a lot of people out of work. There's going to be a few. There's going to be less of us. But guess what? He gives us a brand new platform to build everything back up. Yeah. And that's what people should really be thinking about. After all this is done, how are you going to contribute to changing not the world, but your world? How are you going to do that? Indeed, man. The mm -hmm. Man, there are so many opportunities to capitalize on this in positive ways i'm not saying take advantage of people but capitalize on this situation in positive ways exactly. so man look for them you will find them that's right yeah well awesome man anything else to say about this subject here no i'm pretty good i think well yeah. hey man michael thank you so much for coming out for this podcast and for those folks at home thanks for watching now get out there and train at home. <laughs> and that, that's one more thing. I'm, I'm just going to say one more thing because I, I always sign off my videos saying get out there and train and, and at least a dozen people will say I can't get out there and train. My gym is closed. There is wherever you are. And if you type that in the comments, drop and give me 50 push-ups right where you are. There is where you are. Now get out there and train. At home. At home. Okay. All right. All right. That's good. Oh, thanks, Ramsey. That was fun. <laughs>